Um, <clears throat> welcome, everybody, uh, to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is uh, Frank Henschke. I'm the director here of the program. And um, today, um, we have uh, the great honor and uh, pleasure to have with us uh, masters, grandmasters um, of the theater. We have the great Eugenio Barba here with us together with uh, Julia Valle, um, two, uh, two um, uh, great workers' icons um, or titans in the world um, of theater. So um, welcome, both of you, um, here to Zoom uh, at the Martin Siegel Theater Center. It's a beautiful day in New York. It's uh, sunshine and the uh, trees and flowers are out. And luckily, it's not hot right away. Where are you guys right now? In the same context, in summertime in Denmark, with yeah. a lot of green flowers and sun also. Fantastic. So you are in, in Denmark at your at your own theater? Yes. We just come back from a two weeks long uh, sessions of the ISTA, the International School of Theater Anthropology, which was organized within the Theater Olympics in uh, Hungary. And um, there, Julie and I, we directed a, also a, a performance called uh, Anastasis Resurrection with the, all the teachers, the artists uh, of the International School of Theater Anthropology from Japan, Bali, India, uh, Latin America, and 60 actors, participants. So it was a huge, huge collective <laughs> performance, very, very different from the small ones and intimate one, which we used to do with Odin Theatre. Amazing. Was it inside or outside? Uh, no, it was in the theater, uh, the National Theater, uh, inside. And this is, theater is like the Red Square in, uh, in Moscow, enormous. In, enormous. I must yeah. say they're getting uh, enjoyed to see this amplitude that, 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 uh, that, the, the, that the stage was giving. It's, it's, there is something which fa is fascinating with the uh, Italian uh, style theater, you know, the proscenium theater. I, I find when, when they are well built, they have a heavy history, they really emanate a strong, strong, uh, a strong energy and associative power. So it was a really pleasure to work there. And the staff was very, very competent and, uh, and friendly. Fantastic. This is great. So, and uh, Julia, you went, you went with it. You co-directed or? No, I was uh, assistant director, but I was also on stage. Uh, oh, so yeah. I was on stage with Mr. Peanut, that is this character with a, a skull head. And I was changing from red to black to white. Um, so <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I was quite busy also backstage. But Amazing. Uh, the stage uh, in Budapest is also gives uh, possibilities of stage pieces going down and coming up. And uh, so we really had a lot of uh, fun in this uh, stage with all these possibilities, only that we had just two days to put on stage what we had done in uh, another town in a smaller town with the closed Easter session. And we had two days to adapt it all to the, this big uh, theater stage in Budapest. Amazing. Yeah, Julia joined uh, the Odin Theater in 76. Uh, she's, you know, an actor, a director, uh, she's teaching, of course, and writing. Um, so this is just um, um, fantastic and a bit connected to the world of universities and philosophy, which, of course, we at the Siegel alike, um, Eugenio, you know, is the artistic director, as everybody knows, of the significant, influential um, um, Odin Theater, um, the Theatret, if I say it right, which is based in Denmark. We did a theater talk during the time of Corona, which was a stunning, I think, a, a conversation, listening um, in uh, to him. He has directed over 70 or 80 uh, pieces um, uh, in the world, and he founded ISTA, the International School of Theater Anthropology, and um, he worked closely with Kortowski, he worked closely also with Richard Schachner and, um, and so many, many others, and the idea of uh, uh, exchanging cultural um, um, ideas, expressions, identities in a global way is what's um, 
um, has be, always been at the center um, of his um, his work next to the fact, which I think is so, um, if I may so say so right, amazing, he and his friend got rejected from the big state school. So they stuck together, said we do our own theater company a long time ago, went to a small place in Denmark instead of going to the golden cathedrals um, of uh, the Rome in the speaking of the terms of the churches, and they built a small, beautiful chapel um, in the landscapes of, of Denmark and created a work that uh, has had a global significance and impact, a great archive. And he is also an author of many of the 20, 30 publications. So it's a really a great honor to be here in his presence and uh, to have you with us. So what, what we talk about uh, today uh, is the ongoing activities and what I like about uh, the work that, of course, it's focused on the body, on theater, on training, on performances, on space, but also it always had a larger context. And there's something that exists now, it's called the Fondazione Barba Bali, the both of your last names. So I didn't know about it, to be honest. So tell me a bit, uh, what is this foundation about? There is one question one should ask oneself when, uh, when one has been working in, uh, in theater for more than 50 years, as uh, Julie and I, we've been doing now. What, how can you use the small prestige you have achieved? You can uh, use it for yourself, to continue your activity and show that your creative vitality is uh, not decreasing uh, amazingly. But is there another possibility? If theater is a, 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 a not only entertainment, but tries to, 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 to go beyond the entertainment uh, level. Uh, so can we say that our, our profession, our craft can go beyond the performance and in which way could it continue in time? How this, uh, uh, the, 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 all this knowledge, all this experience uh, can be uh, not only passed on, but also be made accessible because much of the difficulty I had when I was young and was trying to learn was to find places, books, people who were uh, willing to open and share with, with me all this. And this is the reason why, well, I can continue. We can continue with the Odin Theater. We continue with our activities. But what if we could create something which is independent of us so that even when we disappear can continue what were our personal motivations. And I think that what makes the collaboration with Julia so fertile and interesting for me is that we both are very political on our view on, on our profession. And by Politics, I mean a nostalgia, a longing for change. I don't think of left or right. I don't think of Marxism or fascism. I think a longing for changing something here in this plant we are living. Therefore, uh, for us, theater was always a politics with other means, which means not the criteria, not the norms, not the discourse of the uh, parties or the ideological uh, politics, but a completely different means, instruments, which have to do with, uh, I would say, the sensoriality, with the senses, with the, the memory and the experience which are rooted in uh, our biography, which is our body. So, through the body goes the, uh, the message or the communication, and therefore theater would be fine. But once the body is no longer there, when all our experiences become papers, documents, films, photographs, 
posters. Can this, all this experience be transformed and injected in the present as what? As a living archive. And this is the, one of the reasons why we decided at the end of our life, uh, we are, I mean, I am rather old, but to, to, is it possible to create an archive which is not only the refuge for those who, who want to know exactly, for researchers, for scholars, but in, in an archive which is also leading transmission, where there is possible to have activities to, to take all this documentation and transpose into something which can be uh, films, new films, which you can, you can download now. Technology helps enormously to, uh, to, to, to be open access and publish materials in, in a magazine. That was the first thing we did was this, this magazine on theater anthropology, uh, which is uh, uh, part of the rich, uh, documentation we have of these technical uh, comparative seances we had at the Easter the International School of the Anthropology. So this was the reason why the, uh, we started, but not only. This was my personal motivation, but Julia is a completely different motivation because she's a woman <laughs> and she will be speaking about this, of mm -hmm. being a woman in our profession. <laughs> Julia. Yes, well, before I go over to saying what my motivation was for the Fondazione, I would, uh, uh, while Eugenia was talking, I was thinking of once we were in Buenos Aires in Argentina and we had uh, presented performances and had done a, like a public program. But then we traveled in a small minibus of a small theater group from the north of Uruguay who came to get us. And that was uh, all because they had written to us wanting contact and said, how can they come in contact? And we had answered saying, well, we can come and visit you. And it's as if our activity has often been on two levels. At one time, at one place we are like in the public eye and we are recognized and known and also paid money to present performances to give classes. But then a lot of our activity is with theater groups, with those that we also call the nameless in the Fondacion Ibarra Valle. So people which are not known, but that do theater in their own communities, in their own uh, countries, villages, and um, who have this necessity to learn. So Often we are trying to find possibilities where we can meet with them, talk with them, be present and visit them in their own uh, places. It has happened also that we've gone to a very small village in the south of Chile where we work with a theatre group where there were five actors and all the people from theatre that were in Santiago and the capital couldn't believe that Eugenia Barb and Julia Valle were in Chile. And uh, so we pretended to be the cousins or the brothers. <laughs> um, but it has always been fundamental for us to be in contact with these realities. And when we give lectures, also it is so uh, touching to see how people will react when we tell about our difficulties, about the problems and how we started with, rejected from theater schools, and how we made our own uh, culture as a theater group. Now, my motivation for the Fundación has started because I have a, um, a lot of activity with women in theater and uh, I participated in the beginning of the Magdalena project, which is a, a network which started in 1986 and so has been working all over the world. 
And I did a festival in Denmark at Odinteatet called Transit, which I continue with. And at a certain point, I was wondering what would happen with the money I have when I am no longer on this planet. And I wanted very much to be able to contribute to the work of women in theater. And uh, for a long time, we tried to make a trust, it's called in the UK. In Denmark, it was very difficult. But in Italy, uh, they had just made a new law where one didn't need a big capital to make a foundation, a fondazione. And so Eugenio came to me and said, well, I will give you my name, which is, uh, <laughs> one can use it for something. <laughs> so that was the beginning, how uh, to leave some economical support also for women in theater. Then the Fondazione grew uh, during the pandemic, also because uh, we wanted very much to do a session of ISTA, the International School of Theatre Anthropology. And it was a risky economical situation because one didn't know if one could have participants and uh, also the teachers traveling from countries where you still needed permissions and quarantine and uh, vaccination. And, uh, but we really wanted to do this uh, Easter session. We did it in the south of Italy, in Favignana, because we felt that for people working in theatre, to give them back a bit of the energy and the hope and the desire to work and to continue, one needed to have a meeting where the bodies could finally communicate. And so the Fondazione took on itself this economical risk to organize the Easter session. And also the Journal of Theatre Anthropology was one of the initiatives that we did during the COVID time uh, uh, because we wanted to use a lot of the material that is in our archives and transform it and give it like a new life with the journal. So it was interesting also to go back to all the filmed material that we have from the first Easter sessions in uh, 1980 in Bonn, uh, in Germany. And the film material, you can see it's done with very primitive uh, technique, but it is so incredible to see the images of Sanjukta Parigrai, this great Indian Odissi dancer or Katsuko Atsuma, of Guyo Kabuki in Japan and see them talking about their first day of work, explaining the very basics of their technique in these films. And from that, we also have made 10 films about theater anthropology, which are available online for free. And this is also something that we try to do to put our knowledge available for all those um, people that are hungry to grow mm -hmm. and develop mm -hmm. and get in contact with the rest of the world. Incredible, yeah, fantastic. It's almost like a reminds of Joseph Boyce's idea of the free international university where he felt that next to the established academia, you know, there needs to be centers of knowledge, transfers of knowledge, a performing of knowledge um, to, to transfer uh, experience and this ultimately I think is also what uh, this this uh, makes us they're different from the animals you know that we can learn from experiences and tiger more or less will always be a tiger but humans over uh, decades or generations they change fundamentally and it is the transfer of experience um let me ask the Fondazione, is there the physical presence, the physical manifestation of it? Is there an office in Italy or the, I see names of uh, libraries, you know, the uh, the Biblio Museale in Puglia and there is the uh, Bernardini Library in Lecce. So how, where where do we, where can people go and see it? The Fondazione has a, a, an operative 
place in Rome. Where in a, Rome. There's an yeah. office with windows and a computer and exactly. someone sits there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have, uh, we are three, four people only, and we are not in, living in Rome, <laughs> but <laughs> we gather in Rome when we can. We work uh, very much uh, through technological communication of those. The, the, the main uh, person uh, who is taking care in, uh, in, in Italy is Claudio La Camera. He's a lawyer who has been working uh, for the United Nations um, against with pro programs with theater for uh, um, re socializing uh, young people and criminal. So he is also a theater director. So he is taking care of all the administrative bureaucratic uh, aspects. It, it, one of the projects we have, we have many projects. Uh, one of the projects is called sharing knowledge. What, what, uh, what, it is mostly, I suppose, uh, Julius, in my experience of being in Latin America in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, when still there was a difficulty in getting information, books, films for, about theater, and uh, also very expensive. And therefore, we, we, we thought, how can we make accessible all this richness of material which we have accumulated in our archive? And from here, this project of sharing knowledge, which in the beginning was the with a, 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 a was a way, a way of transmitting and injecting the present. So it was done through the journal of theater anthropology. Then we made these films, we put them on YouTube, they can be downloaded. But then I uh, decided to give my library and all my artistic uh, legacy, which could not longer be remain here in Denmark, in Osterbrook, because they were not interested anymore, the new director of the uh, Nordic Theater Laboratorium. So I, I donated all this to the region where I was born, and they accepted on the condition of building what I called living archive floating islands. This is dedicated to theater group. I think that uh, in the 70s, it started already in the 60s, but in the 70s came to, oh, a generation which created a completely new way of imagining, thinking, and practicing theater, and were the theater groups. A theater group has nothing in common in reality with uh, the institutionalized uh, theater as we, we know it. Uh, traditional, artistic, high quality or experimental. Theater groups gather because people want to, on one side to change society or on the other side to change themselves. And therefore Bertolt Brecht or Dario Fo were so fundamental at the time or Artaud and Grotowski became the other reference point. But this was the, I would say, a unique generation which decided to or, or thought all over the planet. The theater was the vehicle to transformation. It was a transformative a tool and not a representative tool. So uh, I, I started the, the imagining that this uh, uh, living archive was, should be dedicated to what I, I call the third theater, which is not the institutionalized uh, art theater or the experimental, but all these groups, these uh, almost uh, mushrooms, which exists for a very short time and then disappears, but which represent today all over the world the majority of performances which are taking places and in places which are anonymous. Therefore, all these anonymous heroism of people doing theater in conditions that never. Uh, Walter Benjamin said the, the, the historians should take care of the memory 
of the nameless, the namen laws, those who mm -hmm. have no name. And this is what the Fondation is uh, trying to, to do. We are directing our activity to the namen laws, the nameless, the, the companies, the groups, the, uh, the activities, which are in a way discriminated, not because society wants to discriminate it, but simply because they are not taken into consideration in what is uh, the context, the material, economical, sociological context in which our profession uh, takes place in, in all over the world. So the, 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 the region in Puglia, uh, in this place, Lecce, uh, the, in this Bernardini uh, library has given several uh, huge uh, rooms and there will be a part dedicated to the a, a sort of center of all our uh, archive uh, of the Odin Theater, the, my personal archive will be there, a copy of it. And then there is a, also a part dedicated to the Odin Theater. And then the biggest part, is dedicated to the group theater, which I consider a particular form of uh, uh, theater, which cannot be compared and is very original, starting from the fact that their uh, coming together is built on a common uh, sharing of a didactic apprenticeship. Uh, they are, most of them are autodidactic, for instance. They have been learning themselves. And second, the way of organizing all their uh, inner uh, group dynamic, not according to a repertory, or say, but according to the fact that all the members have to be part of the performance, adapting the totality of their small uh, microcosmos, we think, or micro society they represent. In, in expressing themselves, all of them, into a, a performance. So there are certain characteristics concerning the professional identity, which are so different from the, uh, the, uh, the, the theater. And this, I find extraordinary in our time, this diversity, which uh, our profession has acquired today, Theater does not exist anymore. Uh, to speak about theater, it's a sort of abstraction. It is the theaters with different purposes, with different techniques, and different audiences and spectators. And therefore, the less privileged part of these different cultures, which is the one of the group theater, of the projects of the, the people, young people coming together and sharing for a certain period a, a, an experience, the sort of a socialization in a society with, where socialization becomes more and more difficult in reality. So I think it's very important to be, uh, to have a place which is a sort of a memorial where people can not only can go and learn about it, but the idea is to, to, you, to transform all these in a sort of artistic installations. Uh, uh, the, the, the living archive is not only transmission, not only memory with documents, but also transformation and artistic transformation, which a designer, an Italian designer, Luca Ruzza and I and Julia, we are working. So you will be coming rooms where you will see strange universe of red, small plants almost. And when you approach them, then a name comes out. But what, what we want is that the thousands and thousands of species should be represented there. And then all the technology which we possess, they can indicate addresses. The people can direct contact them, they can see films on, on the walls, up, down. So today it's impossible to dream of something like this for, uh, for those who are searching, for those who are searching, for young people who want to do an experience which is not the usual one. When you, mm -hmm. when you ask for a physical address 
uh, what I think of is that we what we want to do is to build an environment and the environment of people and how we can get people to meet. And another way we have done, apart from the office in Rome, apart from our computers, which receive the emails and the and Biblioteca in Lecce, we have created itinerant centers, which means that there are uh, theater groups or libraries in uh, uh, Colombia, in Italy, in Greece, in Spain, in Cuba, and they are all working in connection with us and so can make initiatives. And one of the things which we, we are planning for the next year is also a meeting of these itinerant centers so that we will come together. And one of the big projects we have is to make a kind of Woodstock of uh, Third Theater. So of inviting all the groups that we know to one place and make an enormous festival in which we can also exchange the process of work because what we have noticed with the theater groups is that just as important as the result, the performances that are shown is the process and how the different groups work and how one can exchange this knowledge. Just a fantastic uh, idea. So in one way, there is in the library, there will be an installation in some kind of artistic environment, almost like a pavilion at the Biennale where the work of that third theaters, of the nameless, of the unknown, but who in some way are the heroes of theater because it's not about entertainment, but about transformation um, of the world. It, instead it, I don't know if it's possible. This is the first sketch mm -hmm. of the installation about the groups of, uh, <laughs> of, the, yeah. of the groups. Yeah, it's a fantastic idea. And also, you know, the, the title of the talk, which Theater as politics, by other means, of course, re refers to Clausewitz, the military strategist, the Prussian one who said war um, right, is uh, right. politics by other <laughs> means. But uh, to say that, you know, what is stronger is the beauty, what the, the hope that, you know, beauty, art, uh, and knowledge, um, you know, is, um, is um, actually as, as, if not more, powerful, ultimately, um, because it's close to the truth, and it's close to nature and who we are. And we had just had biologist and philosopher Andreas Weber from Germany with us, who reminded us, you know, that nature and art are so connected. That they, it's so chaotic. It's wild. There's no copyright. Um, there are twenty thousand orchids. Even so, the species of the orchids is highly defined, but they come in all shapes and sizes. We do not know about it. But that the idea of producing art, producing theater is what life is and that we are nature. Once you produce theater, you act, you direct, you are nature, it's actually not separate and you are create what is life and that makes planet Earth different from the observable universe of millions of light years where we cannot find any life and the highest expression. And to feel alive in that short time we are on planet Earth, theater is the great way and Eugenio and Julia are finding an archive of you know these great uh, um, human beings, the heroes, as you said, who create theater and uh, connect to life for the community and for others. Um, the idea of apprenticeship, you mentioned it. There's of course a big discussion uh, also in the US, does academia work? Uh, do the big institutions work? And in the old days, theater was apprenticeship or you were born into a family. Uh, what is your? What do you think about it, Eugenio? Uh, about uh, institutions and about initiatives like yours. <laughs> Grotowski used to say that theater is a relationship between uh, two individuals, uh, actors and uh, one actor and one spectator. It's a very beautiful um, definition, but it has nothing to do with the reality because the theater is a sort of trinity. It's the actor, the, the, the spectator, and then the market. And by market, I don't, um, I, I think the, 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 the material conditions in which this meeting can happen. I mean, uh, now we can say that we are, uh, you are a, 
actors and somebody is looking at us, but uh, we have uh, we are we have a space and uh, we have <laughs> a sort of uh, um, information how to find us. The, 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 so no theater can happen without the market deciding and the way you become independent from the laws and the criteria of the market uh, makes you political, efficient. Concretely, the exists, it exists a, 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 a theatrical system which everybody, most of the people consider as the theater. When you think of a theater, you think of a building and this building has certain features, certain characteristics. Then you go there and you buy a ticket and then you expect to have an evening of entertaining uh, intellectual or simply diversion. So this is what in reality has been the origin of our profession in Europe and all over the world. In the 20th century comes a generation of reformers from Stanislavski, Meyer, Kord, Hapia, Craig, uh, Copo, Brecht, and they start thinking theater as art and giving to this art a, another, another uh, value and purpose. It could be political, it could be an ethical, uh, it could be therapeutic, it could be a, a, a sort of creation or approaching the, the masses to beauty, it was a reality. What Stanislavski was dreaming of, because as you were mentioning before, beauty is the truth. And exactly as Dostoevsky, all this ideology, all this vision of how to enlighten the, 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 the people to, to the beauty. It, it characterized the, 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 the efforts which Stanislavski was doing with his uh, 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 art theater. But I would say in all this, you have to prepare. You have to prepare and theater schools prepare, but to which sort of theater are they preparing? The great difference between an institution which accepts actors on the basis of their talent and then they give you a contract and as long as they uh, are useful to each other they remain and work is very different from all the culture of, which is based on projects or on um, theater groups who want to remain a permanent entity because they come together because of a certain affinity, because they, they want to do certain things, which in spite of the different personalities, the, the, the diversity, the conflicts, it can be ideological, an ideological vision, or it can be an aesthetical vision, or it can be a, a, a discriminative vision. Very often today, we know that theater is the possibility for indigenous people to gather together in order to resist a certain uh, yeah, effort to make them similar to the rest of the society. So it, it, I find that on one side, it, 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 the, the market decides how theater schools uh, uh, have to be, but it is fundamental to have a sort of subversive or dissident theater culture, because this dissident theater culture is the one which permits a social people to socialize and create a sort of a, a, a situations which are political in the sense that they change the context in where this happened. So there is no one solution. Multiplicity is the, 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 what characterizes, diversity is what characterizes a real culture. No culture is homogeneous. It's made of hundreds and hundreds of shades of subcultures. 
And the same should be the culture of the other. Therefore, the 60 and the 70s was extraordinary age because we saw clearly that this was possible. And here, I would like to add one of the motivations which I had uh, to work with the Magdalena Project, this network of women in theater, was exactly listening to Eugenia making uh, lectures and talking about the history of theater. And he would come with a long list of men, um, like, just like he's just done, uh, Stanislavski, Michael, Grotowski, Kopo, Arto, Antoine. And uh, I always ask myself, why are the women not present there? And um, I got the answer one day when uh, Sancho Tepanigrai died, and I wanted her very much to continue to touch and, and be in contact with people that people should know about her beauty. And I wrote an article, and this article uh, I sent to an international theater magazine, and the director wrote back to me saying, ah, it is very well written, it is very warm, ah, but I can't uh, print it, I can't publish it because it is too personal. And there I suddenly understood why the women are not present, because obviously we choose to uh, write or to document, to tell about our work with very, uh, very personal language. And there, for instance, with the journal, The Open Page, which is connected to the Magdalena Project, one of my aims has been exactly how to allow women to find a new language, which is not the academic language. And so there, this sub subversive of which Eugenia was talking, for me is, is fundamental in getting women to, to write about their work and to be present in history, not because they adapt to the language which is used in the academia, but because they find a language which is then afterwards accepted. And that is what I found with my own uh, writing. In the beginning, it was very, uh, it was refused from the academia. And now slowly, it is, they are asking me to write, but I have uh, fought a lot to find my own autonomous, independent way of passing on knowledge and so not adapting. And uh, I wanted also to, uh, to tell about uh, the title of one of the transit festivals I made was Beauty as a Weapon. And of course, with beauty, we are thinking of poetry or thinking of nature. We are thinking of uh, fantastic costumes and theater. But also for me, what was interesting was to re-capture uh, a word like beauty, because when you put beauty together with women, the immediate thought is to go to fashion models or to uh, makeup, and how beauty can be thought of with uh, wrinkles, with experience, with old uh, women, with very uh, old faces, and uh, that the experience which is uh, showing through the face through the work is the beauty and not just uh, the word. So also this of recapturing uh, words and finding a language which is adapted to our own experience. And the other thing, because uh, often when one thinks of Eugenio's books and all he has written, one thinks that the books come before the experience. No. The books come after the experience, and it is fundamental to understand that when we try to explain, we are trying to explain something which we have done. And uh, so it is important not to turn upside down or the head over heels our experience. First comes the experience, and then we can try and talk about it, write about it, and teach it. Yeah, quite, quite a quite a big statement. If you really, really think about it, if you really take it serious, and 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 it's true. I 
I agree. It's uh, life, of all, first of all, is experience. It's not meaning, not so much about meaning, as Yang reminded us. Um, but also we have to experience first. And then perhaps also in the way come to theories and collections like the book Eugenio uh, put together. Eugenio uh, might be an unfair question, but um, when we, you were young and you were a welder, I think, and on, you worked in the shipyards and you didn't know where your life was going, but you had that inside voice to do theater, to perhaps create something. Um, and what is the experience you at that time wish someone would have told you what is the essence you know in a way of uh if you may say to many young artists i'm sure i listen to academics what is what would you have liked to know at that time when you i don't know where you were in some bar or in them small place where you were sleeping to get back to work in the shipyard the next day what would have made a difference to you what made it, 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 the difference was an experience uh, which was uh, 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 very radical because I lost my language. I was an Italian who had been uh, in the 50s studying humanistic uh, Latin and Greek, eight years in Latin, five years Greek. I could translate Sophocles and Platon, <laughs> but I could not speak one foreign language. So when I went to Norway and started working, nobody understood me. I couldn't understand. I, couldn't, I was considered a, a stupid person because I couldn't express myself. And I also myself felt very, very stupid. And uh, this experience made me uh, uh, become extremely aware of the behavior of the people the way they were speaking to me, the intonation of their of the voice or the body. Uh, it was a introverted or extroverted way. Uh, how was the, 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 the sound, the, the musicality of, of their speech connected to the way their face was saying it or the, the, their eyes? So, so all these was for me a huge lesson, which made me become very grateful every time I met human compassion. I, I, it was the 50s, and the Italian at the time in Europe were considered still fascist people, a, a people of Howard, people who had lost the, uh, the Second World War, they had been collaborating with Hitler, they had been fighting uh, with Franco in Spain. So there was a lot of racism in Norway. As an Italian, I was considered a spaghetti, I was called spaghetti when I was a sailor for two years or a merchant boat. It was, a, racism was horrible. But at the same time, what, what I kept in mind was not the wounds I received, but the generosity of people. And this is this generosity, which for me is the meaning of, um, or let's say the substance of my energy in spite of age, because I, I have a feeling that I have to give back what I received from these generous people. Uh, the, the Norwegians who, who ad adopted me, a family, a very poor family of communists. They adopted me because they, they, they want to be solidary, show solidarity towards this poor emigrant. <laughs> so all this has remained in me, as well as uh, the, the owner of the, of the workshop I was working. The, the, the patience and the, I would say, the right, just uh, fair way of, of, of treating me, in spite that I didn't know anything. It let me really grow uh, on my skill as well, uh, without practicing, without. So all this is what has um, become the, the substance of my <laughs> judgment or my uh, standpoints uh, towards life, 
towards the profession. I mean, all Odin Theater is, uh, is the, the attempt to recreate my workshop in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Oslo, when, when I went there already, the, the, the owner was us, uh, waiting for us. He was sharing, they explained to us what to do, and then all the time following us. Anytime we had the problem, we went to him. And we respected him not because he was the owner, but because he helped us and he knew more than us. And he worked more than us. Therefore, and from this person, and similar examples which have nothing to do with theater. I have absorbed my way of, uh, a, I would say, a sort of ethos. Ethos in the sense of behavior, not only of moral, moral obligations I feel towards other people or towards society or towards nature or towards but also a, 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 a behavior, the way you behave towards the others. So all this is the, the something which you cannot transform into a method and put on a, on a book and say, so should it be. No, I, I, I think that uh, the experience Julia is speaking about is fundamental and, uh, and, and therefore, I was always, I always touched from a human point of view. When I went in the, in the most uh, abundant places in this planet, and then I find a small theater group or some just amateur doing theater and seeing this sort of warmth coming out, sort of light, uh, just a spark. Of course, my aesthetical and theatrical experiences, most of them are from traditional theater. <laughs> I have seen Berlin Ensemble, I have seen the, the Polish theater when it was at its height with the, in, the, in, in the 60s, it's unbelievable. What it, I've seen recently a, 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 a performance um, by Falking, Valenti uh, uh, Falking, uh, uh, which was re, re Taking again a, a mascarada of a medical, unbelievable, beautiful, fantastic. But from a human point of view, from a political point of view, from, I would say, a criterion of a theater going beyond theater. So I use this group, theater, these, 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 these projects, these. Um, they are they, they are very, very close to me. Mm -hmm. But the two books, the Secret Art of the Performer and the Five Continents of Theatre, you have written saying that that is the kind of knowledge that you would have liked to have had exactly. when you started. So, exactly. So you have yeah. also tried to give. Uh, yes. yes. If it was pos is it possible to write a theatre history? From the point of view of an actor, this is what the five uh, the five continents yeah, of the a stunning book, a stunning book. I have it, yeah. yeah. And um, it's very strange because there is no almost no author mentioned in this, but the the the, the, the experience how you you you, you were to, to 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 perform in such a way that people is, is to pay a ticket because the invention of ticket when the, the, the in, in the in, in, in Europe when the first company professional company gathered joins together what they are inventing is the freedom of the actors before they were the bishops they were the aristocrats who decided for the actors and but when the actors decide that by letting each spectator pay a very small amount, they can become free from what all the theater history shows us, where those who decided what sort of performance should be, the church in Europe and the, and, then, uh, and the aristocracy. Then 
the theater. The theater became, in, in, during the Renaissance, Comedia dell'Arte, Shakespeare, look at the, the richness, the freedom, the, the vitality, uh, the, the violence showing a, a, an age which is changing. But also, sociologically speaking, the possibility for poor people, for women, for uh, uh, homosexuals, for serfs, or aristocrats who had no longer any money or any title to join and live through theater, a sort of freedom which their time did not give them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a democratization of the theater art through tickets to sales. It's a fantastic book, The Five Continents. Not only do you have conversations about, you know, a dialogue, you know, about the book itself and it was your collaborators, um, but I like the idea of what you said, to see the history of theater through the eyes through the experience of the actor. Claire Bishop, who's an art historian, says, let's look at art, art history, but let's look through theater and performance. Why does it have to be painting and sculptures? But you say, with, even within theater, why? Let's look through the eyes, the experience of the body, of the actor over centuries. And you created an incredible archive put together in a book is a fantastic, brilliant, uh, um, as you would say, a wild garden, you know, at the end of, of theater. There is no copyright in nature. There is no copyright. You feel in theater, things multiply. It's chaotic. It's all, um, I think, a movement, and it's all encounters. People go somewhere here, there, movement. Michelangelo said all art is movement, and I think he's right. Uh, Eugenio, we, uh, before we go, I, we have some time. You went from Italy to Norway, you ended in Denmark, and in a way you are going back to Italy with your archives and your work. You spent time there in Lecce. What does Italy mean to you? What is the landscape? Well, how, how are you connected to it in your memory? I, I was very influenced by the, my um, uh, childhood in a small village in South Italy. Because um, I, I, I was the son of a widow, <laughs> and in, when my father died, my mother could not go out in the evening because a, a widow should not go out. In the, I mean, the, the, this was a, a time uh, which is very difficult to, 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 to understand today in Italy. But, and um, so I was very, when I left, uh, Italy, I had gone through a, the experience of a military school. I made all of my high school in a, in, in a military college. And what for me in, in, in Norway was, was a freedom, freedom and, and discovering how, how limited I was. Uh, being Italian, I, had, I, I, I ignored the all the literature when I started reading, was able to read the Norwegian and discovering Norwegian literature was unbelievable. How my, my, my mind, boom, exploded. And therefore I never felt Italian. Uh, although I, I feel a great pleasure in eating only Italian food. I mean, uh, when I eat all the rest, even French, it, for me, only the Italian food is, for instance, food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my mind, my brain is satisfied together with my stomach. When I eat all them, I eat every day Scandinavian, Scandinavian food often. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, but it's uh, not Italian. So in a way, I am Italian, but at the same time, I when I go back to Italy now, it's a very a foreign country. I've been away for almost. Uh, 70 years. And the, and the place when I go and visit Gallipoli, this small village of fishermen, poor people, immigrants, misery, Catholic women going there and mumbling in Latin. They were an alphabet, these women, but they were sort of mantra, blah, blah, blah. In Latin. All this, the perfume of incense, all this is disappeared. Now, the deep place become a very fashionable uh, tourist place. Um, unbelievable to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah, impossible to be there in summertime. There are thousands 
people because it's very beautiful. It's, it's only small eyes. What are your first memories? Do you remember what do you what do you remember first as a child when you grew up there? Your first memory ever. My first memory are in reality the bombing of the body when I was there with my, my family. And uh, this is the, the first memory. It's you were in the house? You were in the house? Or yeah, well, the house my father has just come back from Africa. <laughs> he had been worked, he had been fighting with Rommel. It, it, it was Rommel, incredible. So, mm. so he, he was uh, here, he, he, he returned just before the armistice when uh, Italy capitulated. And then first they allied, the, uh, the Americans started bombing Bari, which is a, the town where we were living with my family. And then the Germans, when uh, Bari was liberated by the, uh, by the allied, so, so the Germans started bombing. And I remember, uh, this is the first memory I, I clearly uh, remember of uh, the, yeah, the terror, the terror of this uh, bombing. Uh, still in my, in my body, I was sort of a reflex because we couldn't go to a refuge because my father could not move, he was on the bed. So we remained in the apartment around of my father's bed, and my mother, my brother and I, and I remember we kept each other's hands and then every time there was a bomb, all these tensions in our hands, this is what I remember, this physical memory of hands trying to keep in, uh, or giving each other uh, sort of uh, uh, courage. Yeah, incredible, yeah, and then, out of war, using then theater is politics by other means, and so it's it's quite quite an um, quite an experience. Do you remember? So we think I remember Dario Fo speaking with Dario Fo, um, with we can also talk about it with for Franca Ram. We did together the only, as far as I know, uh, memorial for Franca Ram, um, and he 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 talked about uh, his memories of the glass blowers. I think you know, and uh, visiting comedians. What are were there experiences of kind of transit of music, of art, or artisans in, in, in your memory of the town where you were? I, I, I live, my family was a family of very bourgeois lawyers and doctors, so there were books in, uh, in home. My brother, my older brother, was an intellectual, he was the real intellectual of the family. And he read very much, but I was, um, I began to read. And, uh, and when I was in Norway as an immigrant, because um, I, after work, I went to the library and started reading the Italian books in order mm -hmm. to have a sort of <laughs> company in something. You know? And this was the moment where uh, I, I started discovering that uh, literature was another uh, uh, universe. And, and which I, I really enjoy to to. And now your entire your entire personal library is in in uh, in Puglia, I guess, and the library people can come and all your your personal collection, your collection of this art, is, art. There, or, is there. Or there are books in Polish, book in yeah. Norwegian, book in Danish, books in Portuguese, book in Spanish, book in Italian, French, English. Yeah, eight, 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 nine languages. Yeah, and amazing. And what's your your personal collection? You said what is what can people see there? Oh, a lot of books about anthropology, about history of religions, a lot of novels, a lot of about esotericism, a lot about um, um, uh, guerrilla books about the general Jap who defeated the the, the biggest and strongest nation in the world, the United States. You know, the yeah. Vietnam War. Um, um, books on by um, how to make a, a, a coup d'etat, uh, Malaparte's uh, treatise on how to make a, a, such a coup d'etat, or uh, even um, uh, Che Guevara's uh, and many others, guerrilla. Uh, uh -huh. Because the guerrilla books teach you one thing, how to, as a theater group, live in an hostile environment mm -hmm. and how to conquer one person after the other. 
through the ideas and the, what we are doing. And for me, when I arrived from Norway to Denmark, which was a completely new country, country with my actors were Norwegians, we didn't speak the same language. And we were doing a theater which nobody understood, not only because of the language, but also because we were doing a, a performance in a, a, in a gymnastic uh, space. This was in 1965, in 1966, when still the great revolution of 68, where the traditional space is uh, blown up, no? Then, mm -hmm. therefore, it, it, it was evident, it was a huge reaction, negative reaction of the population against the politicians who had accepted us in a horse blow. So for years and years, Odin Theatre has been living in Horstebro with a very hostile population who consider us foreigners, a parasite, uh, without any uh, utility. So this also has been a, a huge, huge uh, teaching period, <laughs> a learning period for me and my actors. Yeah, so yeah. the library, uh, with Eugenia's books, we are trying also to turn it into a kind of installation. For instance, we're going to have books under a glass uh, floor. We're going to make some of the library into a kind of labyrinth. And then there will be uh, books hanging and books <laughs> flying. <laughs> so it, it will not be a totally normal library. Incredible. I really can't wait to come and visit. When is there time for an opening of it? Uh, is there a... You know, Italy is a beautiful country, but uh, it has been uh, colonized by bureaucracy. Yeah. So everything goes forward, two steps forward, one step back. So this, it, will, <clears throat> it will already have a sort of opening in October, but I imagine that next year begins. Next year the wings to where we can begin to fly at other level. Fantastic. I mean, this is incredible. Um, like in this talk today, you know, you, you guys, you both are sharing your experience, your knowledge, and your deep love for the theater and also your conviction that it can and does and will make a difference. And your work is a living example of it and a live, a live uh, right. example. And that for part of nature, you know, of the very force um, of, of being alive. And then and, and you shared it also um, and today. I think it's so exciting. Everybody who listens to us one day, I think you should go, theater students, actors, and people will come anyway. And um, what a beautiful um, um, undertaking that next to the performing world, which is so ephemeral and is, I think, Carl Valentin, a great comedian of the time of Brecht said, you know, theater is like a snowman from last year. When it's gone, you might have the carrot or the charcoal, but you can't explain what it was. You know, it's gone and it transformed already. But you now find, in a way, as you said, in the multiplicity, a way to, you know, uh, touch the elephant of theater for many sides and to understand a little bit better, ultimately, that you have to make up your own mind and create your own a group and your own uh, artistic experience. So I would really like um, to thank you all. I think also the foundation for sure is open. There is a website. Um, I think we have it on our um, homepage. So I'm sure there could be connections, how universities, artists, companies can connect or contribute to be part of your installation. So both of you really, really thank you. And maybe if I may ask, next to this incredible work, what you are preparing, are you uh, also, do you have theater projects up on your mind, in your sleeve? Are you preparing something? Yeah, but <clears throat> I'm working now on uh, two diff new uh, productions with Odin Theater here in Denmark. Yeah. Next year is 60 years of our uh, existence. Yeah. And there are several places so they are organizing uh, small parties to celebrate this, uh, this feat. And I have another project, which um, yeah, also in Italy, because uh, they have, they have a, a pedagogical project, I would like it to make a, a very particular uh, special theater schools, which last only six weeks. And these six uh, weeks where the 
the few participants can work with uh, 14 different uh, artists from different traditions. We're from uh, Japanese No and uh, Malinese uh, Topeng, uh, Jinju, Beijing Opera, uh, Indian Katakali, Brazilian um, Bumba So that for one week at a time, they are simply immersed in this extraordinary multiplicity and ingeniosity, which the human beings have uh, uh, invented and generated with the uh, uh, performing techniques. So this is the next project I am dealing with. Incredible, fantastic. And I hope uh, there is a way to, to also communicate or be part of it or be there or look at it. So thank you, Eugenio and uh, Julia also, both of it, and all our um, respect um, for your work's life, uh, what you achieved, uh, what you put together. It's truly, you are, um, you are titans in the field. You are stars, you know, like the sailors. You were a sailor, you know, when they're in the ship on the ocean and you look up how to orient, not in the sense of the Hollywood, but in the sense of guiding you know, on ways to go. No, and but, uh, we thank you, uh, Frank, and then the Stadium Foundation, because you have been doing an unbelievable, unbelievable uh, uh, effort in all this period with uh, during the COVID. You have now really an anthology, an unbelievable anthology of uh, what we theater people in different parts of the world, we're thinking yeah. and imagining in that uh, 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 period. So, yeah, you are thank you. So, fantastic. Thank you. That really means the world to me uh, to hear that from you. And thank you. Thanks to HowlRound for hosting us, Talia, Vijay, everybody um, at the Sikh Center and here at the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan. I mean, it is things like this that we miss uh, actually here in our life and uh, in the downtown life. It's so complicated at the moment for companies and hearing you speak, uh, uh, it, I think is a, a great reminder, you know, of what that, what we do is all about and how significant, important, how fragile, but also how alive uh, it, it makes uh, a city, our own lives and a community. So thank you all. And I hope um, some of you will come back when we have a talk with Dorota Maslowska. We just published books from a great Polish uh, playwright. Um, it's going to come up at the Bohemian National Hall. We're going to have the talk, I think, um, this Thursday. So um, both of you, thank you. Goodbye. I hope to Goodbye. see you in person soon one day, and I will come to the opening. If there is one, I will try to really make it. And um, please, all of you, um, enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Julia. Bye-bye, Eugenia. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -b